the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Winslow Homer and Godzilla on the rampage. Zombie science under a graveyard sky. Solarian League thugs put in their places. Plus, part 23 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have part two and the conclusion of an interview with Bain cover artist extraordinaire Bob Eggleton. Bob has been doing covers for Bain from the ancient of days. He's responsible for hundreds of Bain covers, including many this year. Since Bob is not one of those shy artist types, we had a fascinating conversation with him so fascinating and engrossing that we decided to present it in two parts. We have the conclusion of that interview coming up. We also have a book recommendation from a new Bane author, Marcus Wynn, whose supernatural thriller will be out in 2014. And, of course, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, Bane Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Hey, check out the Bain.com website. Every month we have a free short story and a thought-provoking and sometimes madness-provoking nonfiction piece. Next month sees the release of a new John Ringo series called Black Tide Rising uh, that features science-based zombies. The first book in the series is called Under a Graveyard Sky. And it's the first of, a, I guess you call it a tetralogy. Is that a trilogy plus one? Yep. Now, I've read the whole thing in draft, I mean the whole series, and I have to tell you, this one's good. Ringo's at the top of his form. Excellent. People are going to be jealous of you. Yeah. So, to get you ready for Under a Graveyard Sky, we have a great piece by research neurologist and science consultant Dr. Ted Roberts. Ted takes an in-depth look into what it might take to create a scientifically accurate version of the zombie apocalypse. Case in point, John Ringo's new book? That's right. Or any zombie apocalypse, really, that, that isn't supernatural. So Ted Roberts is also a science fiction fan, and at conventions he's known as speaker to lab animals. He's done some other excellent science stuff for the website, too, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely he has. And you can find those articles and lots more in our free ebook editions of all the website nonfiction articles. Uh, you can download all the nonfiction we published on the website in 2013, 2012, 2011, all free if you go to BainEbooks.com. Uh, to find these books, you put in the words free nonfiction in the BainEbooks.com search box, and those books will pop right up. Can you get a free ebook of the website fiction, too? Heck yeah, you can type in free short stories in that search box at BainEbooks.com and those collections will pop up and you can download them in any format you want, including Kindle, of course. But to check out Ted's current article on zombie science, you need to go to the Bain.com website. It's right there on the front page. And now, here's the conclusion of our two-part interview with Bain cover artist Bob Eggleton. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about your influences. I mean, you've you've mentioned a, a whole bunch. Um, I I know that. I mean, I can see that you're influenced by uh, color uh, watercolor artists like William Turner or um, Winslow Homer. I mean, it just it, it's yeah. it's clear you're you're highly influenced by them. But they're you know they, they they're kind of known for their watercolors. Well, Turner did oils. I mean, if you go to yeah. the Tate, I've gone over to the Tate over in Britain, and that's kind of the home of that's where he. His majority of his work is when it's not on tour, and there's there's a couple of there's the Yale the Yale Center for British Art, which is beautiful. They've got some great Turners in there, and he did mostly work in oil. Um, his most um, he, he got looser as he went along, and as he became demented as he got older, 
Um, he started doing these really surrealistic things that nobody was sure if they were finished or they were just started. It was just they 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 just weren't sure. They would just, they were just cascading light everywhere. And I see something in all of that because it's again it's like about progression. Turner is a great artist. Uh, he and he worked in watercolors too. His watercolors tend to be a lot smaller now. Homer, he worked in watercolors, but he also did some beautiful paintings of the main coastline in oils. Yeah. And well, he did those in oils because he rented um, he rented a house one at one point, and there was no heating at the time, of course. So he had a fireplace, that he, and it was one of the coldest winters ever in Maine. It was so cold that his entire house and the studio they had ice. He had ice literally creeping in from everywhere, and the only way there wasn't ice was right in front of his fireplace. And so he would paint in front of the fireplace with hand warmers on and things like that. And he would admit that his hands were were freezing up. Up and and the oil paint, which does get affected by w- weather, um, would be less affected because, of course, it's oil, so it would take a little little. But if he was working in watercolors, the water would immediately the water would freeze. So he had it, he did it out of necessity, and he did some spectacular pieces of the ocean. Um, uh, John Singer Sargent is another artist. He did some great, yeah. incredible landscapes late in his career, and. Um, you know, uh, Homer. Homer was told at one point uh, because he used to paint children at the beginning of his career. He painted, did bring his painting career. He did paint children, and so they said to him up in Boston, he had a studio in Boston. They said, you know, just paint kids, just paint kids. You'll be, you know, be. Great. And then they said, don't ever paint the ocean. You'll never be any good at it. It'll never sell. So, <laughs> of course, what do we remember him for? We remember him for his paintings on the Maine coast. You know, I mean, they're just. And, you know they're just awe-inspiring. Uh, another great artist I like. I can I could name so many artists. John Martin. Um, uh, he had an amazing exhibit over in England uh, a few couple of years ago. We went over special to see it, and his work it influenced filmmakers Ray Harryhausen. It influenced uh, he's uh, many uh, science fiction filmmakers cite him as an influence because of his uh, his work. And what was really nice was that the exhibit there was a quote from Ray Harry house and that kind of kicked off the exhibit as you go inside so that was this really nice uh that was a really nice connection between science fiction our you know science fiction and and fine art you know and 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 uh i mean these guys john martin is is incredible he, he did watercolors too he worked in gouache which is kind of a kind of a, a, a opaque watercolor and another artist i like is arnold Bucklin, and he's a a, a austrian um surrealist and he would paint he painted a painting everybody's seen it you just don't realize you've seen it. it's called isle of the dead and if you you just google it you look it up it's 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 just the most kind of scary and impressive looking painting you'll ever see because it's it's really just it's really really creepy but but and and it's been used in a lot of a lot of um uh, you know, a lot of people have used it for either reference or for, um, you know, there was even a film made of it by um, Val Luton many years ago, uh, based on the painting. Um, yeah, and they made, a, they made kind of a, a horror film out of it. Uh, yeah, there's, and, you know, and then you get these, uh, you know, incredible artists, and they they just did, they did some um, just amazing work. And for me, uh, I look back at that, and and that's the stuff that I I look at. And when I was de- trying to develop my own style. Um, I would go out and try to find, uh, you know, I, you know, I was not, I was less, cons- I was less interested in copying or being another Frazetta or being anything, you know, saying like, you know, can you copy Frazetta? No, 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 no. There's only one Frank Frazetta. The ideas go where he was inspired from, and you go back and you look at Francisco Goya's work or something like that, and you see this is where he came from. Another guy I love is Gustave Doré, and now this guy did um, really wild stuff. I mean, he illustrated the Bible and he did all kinds of stuff like with, like, you know, uh, visions of the book of Revelations and like, you know, hell and demons and things like that. And then he would do other things like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And he did all these like, you know, different sea monsters and sea spirits and things like that. And they were just, they were done in etchings. And he would also do rarely seen, he would do color oil paintings and all of his work had this great, um, thick, thick, uh, thickly put on painterly type approach to all of his landscapes. And there was always something very moody about them. And, uh, and, and these guys just, I mean, they just, they just, blew, they just floored me. They yeah. just were really absolutely amazing. How do you, uh, how do you decide what medium you're going to use for a particular work? Oh, it depends. Sometimes it depends how fast I have to get it done. Uh, although I've, 
a few years, I've used exclusively acrylics for a good deal of my career. And um, in 2007, my wife, my wife's an oil painter, as well as a writer, she's an oil painter, she was working in oils. And I'd come in the studio and I'd smell this, like, you know, smell of oil paint. I was always like, oh, you know, I, I, I love the smell of that oil paint. And, you know, I'm tired of the smell of, uh, you know, the, the, the rather sometimes ammonia smell of acrylics, which are really, it's really interesting because acrylics are about, the chemical composition of them is they're about 10% color and 90% medium. And the medium they use is kind of like a refined version of Elmer's glue is what it is. That's why it dries so fast. And when I started seeing oil paintings and, and seeing the, 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 the translucency and the, the workability of oils and the fact that oils dry as a medium, they dry as the oil itself actually dries out. It, be, it becomes, it changes composition. It goes from, from liquid to solid um, right on the canvas. So that's why you, uh, it doesn't change. It looks exactly like it is. Whereas acrylics, they lose volume as they dry. So therefore, the colors not only, the colors not only change, but the actual volume of the paint shrinks so that by the time it's fully set up and dried uh, within hours, or, or I mean, it, acrylics don't take long at all to dry. They take minutes to dry sometimes. So by the time it goes on and it dries, it's actually already changed. So you've got to go back in and work it up to where you, know, you get to tweak the colors and make them back to where you had originally visioned them to look. Uh, although there's nothing, and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I, and I just did something recently where I, I decided I wanted to lash out in acrylics to see if I was still good at it and use up some of the acrylics sitting around here. And I got into it. I really stuck into it and I did a really nice acrylic painting. And then I went on to an oil painting and I realized it was a vast difference in not only thinking, but how I was working and everything. And it was a real culture shock for me. It was very, very interesting, very interesting, um, uh, you know, a jolt, if you will. And so usually nine out of 10 times I will use oils. Um, but, but acrylics I will use if I'm absolutely strapped for time and I've got to get something, you know, finished and done. And, um, and then maybe I'll even highlight it with oils. I'll put highlights of oils over it. So, um, and occasionally I work in watercolors too. Watercolors are nice to work in. They're, they're a medium that takes a lot of uh, wrangling. You have to sit down and, and you have to get in another place because you really can't make mistakes good in, in, in watercolors. You have to, when you put the color down, it's very hard to go over it with anything because, and so you have to usually work light to dark rather than dark to light, which is the way I work with acrylics and oils. I work from dark to light. I put my darks down first and then I build it up, I build it up to my light areas because everything's okay and it's going to go over it. But with watercolors, if you work in watercolors, it's just if you put the darks down first, it's going to absorb all of your light colors. So I have to put the light colors down first. So it's a, it's a whole different way. It's a whole different thinking in, in application. Yeah. Well, um, and speaking of influences, you know, at this point in your career, there's a lot of young painters out there who are kind of doing takes on Eggleton. Um, how do you keep it fresh so that you're not lost in, you know, all the Eggleton? <laughs> well, what I do is I do, I've done things that are completely out off the um, off the um, really out of the out of the box. You know what I mean? I'll do something that involves like a few years ago, ten years ago, I did a book called Dragon Hench, and it's kind of an illustrated novel with my my writer friend John Grant. And I was doing, I had to get a bunch of artwork done in a very set period of time, um, and so I did things with color pencils, and I used paper. I was using colored papers and using those kind of glued into it, and I draw back over the colored papers, and people are looking at it going like, "That's a Bob Eggles, like, wow, like that," you know. So I like to be able to be varied and get and get away from my, um, you know, get away from my usual style, and it it's, it it doesn't sometimes, you know, it it does it, it doesn't give you a sense of um a lot of people worry because they 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 want to prefer consistent mediocrity rather than erratic genius and um I, you know i just like to experiment i mean art art any kind of art i care if you're writing if you are drawing it's all about experimentation and doing different things and doing different things in different ways and it keeps you it one feeds the other it's like if you're if i'm doing one set thing a certain way it can get really 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 
almost boring. Oh, I, you know, I'll just come out and say it. It'll get very, very, you know, yeah, that low, well, yeah, it's a typical Bob. You know, they'll say something like that. Whereas if I do something a little bit different, people will say, well, that Bob did that? Wow. Like that, you know, and then I will feel like, well, I've done something a little bit different. Then I'll go back to my old way of working and it'll actually feel refreshing and interesting because I've varied off, you know, I've, I've gone off and done something else that was a little more uh, interesting. Um, and, and then I come back to what I used to be doing that everybody knew me for and I come back to it with a fresh attitude. I come back to it with a fresh view and um, for me that's that's a lot of fun to yeah. do. I like I like I like that kind of dual dual kind of artsy way of being. You're kind of a fixture in uh, science fiction conventions, or you were for a long time. Do you, do you still go to art shows at conventions, check out who's doing what? Yeah, I do. Uh, although what's been happening is a lot of the art shows, of course, everybody, like, I would say 80% of people work in, work in digital. So when they put up the art shows, they're putting up, they're putting up essentially prints that are matted or, or shrink-wrapped or whatever. And it's fine, but it's just you're looking again at a reproduction. So whether you're looking at the book cover, you're looking at a print, you're still looking at a reproduction. And very, there's a handful of artists who still just do do the original paintings. Um, and I mean, I, I will go to see that. And there's a handful of conventions, conversely, that still have original artists at them. And so, you know, I've, I, and also something has happened in the last 30 years. When a thir- you know, 25 years ago, it was a lot. I was a younger guy. I really was. So I could really had a lot more energy in me. I could stay up all night. I could fly to all these different places, uh, you know, eat airport food and so on. But as you get older, that, that becomes more more of an issue because you just you just get you know you don't want to you know you just get like where you don't have the energy to do it and for me to get ready to ramp up for a convention it takes a full week to 10 days ahead of time to ramp up for it and then another two days rest when I get back because I'm so exhausted now if I'm in the middle of working that's going to start and you just go to a lot of these conventions a year that just starts taking chunks of time out of your life so I have to be very careful about where I go and what I'm going what convention I'm going to you know and uh, I mean for example is a good example. There's at the end of this month. There's the H.P. Lovecraft convention uh, called. Uh, it's called uh, Necronomicon. It's right in Providence, so it's no big deal for me to actually attend it and to do some panels. And I've got two pieces in this art show that's in a very prestigious gallery, and they're not doing it like a typical art. Sh- they they wanted original artwork and everything, so I was able to supply that. And uh, then ten days afterwards, we're going to Illuxcon, which is uh, illustrators and art type related convention. That's going to be in Allentown, Mass. In Allentown, Pennsylvania, um, and uh, in the second week of September, and we do that. And between all that, they're having the Worldcon, but I'm not going to the Worldcon. So if I went to the Worldcon in Texas, and, and God love them, I hope they have a, I hope they have a good Worldcon. But if I went there, it would just, it would demolish me. I would come back like a, a, a at the end of that, I'd be a little, a little, a little ball of whatever, and I'd be, you know, I'd have to go rest for like, you know, a week and. Of course, I got to get things done, and yeah. so I have to be judicious in what what conventions I'm going to. And uh, you know, I still manage about a, a you know seven or eight a year. You know, so it's still it's still a lot. Well, it sounds like you're <laughs> you're still pretty active. Well, so tell us after a life of uh, making art, movie design, you you know theme park design, is there anything you still want to do that you haven't had a crack at that you'd like a crack? I, you know, at? I'd like you know again if some more movie work came my way, and it might. I am not I'm not liberty to talk about it, but it might. Um, that would be fun. Um, I want to do a, um, sort of a, 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 an art book of type, um, and, uh, it's going to be sort of one of my, my, the working title is Bob Eglin's Gods and Monsters, and we're, we're coming up with that and seeing where that's going to go. And then I've got some, some ideas that I want to do for these epic paintings that are, I mean, absolutely giant paintings, like, you know, uh, six, eight foot long paintings that are just epics. And, um, you know, the great, I mean, I love natural phenomena, volcanic eruptions, storms, uh, all kinds of things, you know, uh, things happening. And of course, you know, again, man minuscule in, in, the, in the big picture of that. Um, uh, I'm doing a, a project, a Kickstarter project that some, some people are involved with called Frenzy, and it's about sharks. And uh, it's, 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 Really great. It's 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 a lot of it's going to be illustrated, no, um, uh, sort of an illustrated novel. I want to say graphic novel, but it's quite not that. Where it's going to be a number of artists involved, and if it goes through, it'd be really great. And the author's name is Drew Gaska, and he's he's 
really good at uh, it's kind of a 70s style uh, shark type I mean, you know a shark type uh, science fiction crossover type thing so they uh, they they've asked, they've asked me to get involved with that and that's that's a lot of fun and these are these are things that I you know I've got all kinds of stuff there's always the year holds different you know, different promise every single year. I think of things I want to do and places that, you know, places I'd like to go art wise and stuff and project wise. And, uh, you know, um, eventually again, like I said, movie work is nice. Um, but again, you know, when you move from one book to a, one movie to another, to another, another, you start getting a little, it starts getting a little dunning. So you, you need to have that variety going on and, and the variety and diversity. And my dad, one of the, the bits of information other than, Using common sense, my dad left me with uh, before he died. Is he's like you know diversify everything. He said just just diversify everything you're involved with. And so I, I tend to agree, and that's what's probably kept me going all these thirty years. It's just that I do a lot of different things. I do horror, I do science fiction, I do fantasy. Then I'll go out and I'll paint like landscapes out in like on the sea or something like that, just near me. Cause I live near the ocean, and, and they sell too, you know. <laughs> and so I just I, I find myself. Um, you know, I think that if you specialize too much, you can become a dinosaur really fast. But if you you keep things, the dice is you keep things rolling, you keep things uh, fluid and moving. Um, you never really settle down to any one thing, and there's a sense of anxiety that goes with that. But it also keeps you on your on your toes, and um, you know it keeps me in in a position where I can do a lot of different things. But I, I'd love to do some, you know, some more some of my more big epic type paintings and. Again, like I'll do book covers and I'll make them an excuse to be one of my epic type works. You know, whether I, you know, whether it's a great vista on another planet or something like that. I mean, and, and, and I'll try to make it. I'll say, well, you know, I'm going to paint. I'm painting it anyway, so I might as well not only incorporate the ideas in the book, but I'd like to also incorporate and make it like a landscape that type thing. You know. Well, we've been talking to Bob Eggleton, multiple award-winning artist and Bain cover artist extraordinaire. Um, some of Bob's recent covers include Tour of Duty by Michael Z. Williamson, Dragon, Dog and Dragon by Dave Freer, and it's, uh, it's prequel, uh, Dragon's Ring, Portal, which we talked about, um, by Reich Spohr and Eric Flint, and just all in Transgalactic, uh, A.E. Van Vaux we put out, the entire Bain Heinlein trade paperback series, and much, much more. Bob, thank you so much for being with us on yeah, the podcast. No problem. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoy I enjoy talking like this. I'm, I'm you know, like I said, it's always always good to get out and talk to people and to. Uh, I mean, I'm really really glad people love my work and um, I'm there to you know. It's always nice. That, you know, very I'm a very lucky guy to have that. A very lucky person to have people that enjoy the work that much. And I'm and I'm as much of a fan of the genre. I, I love the genre as much as you know as much as people might love what I do in it. You know what I mean? So there's a nice little there's a nice little like one one thing feeds off the other and uh and i like to keep that going and uh for me it's, it's uh, you know it's it's all about it's all about having fun if you can have fun doing it that's the best way to do it and uh let's let's have it not let's have it not get too dull let's let's always keep let's keep the fun in it and um and i'm hoping that'll keep going we like to ask some Bain authors uh, for a book recommendation that readers out there might like to take a look at. And we have with us Marcus Wynn. And Marcus Wynn is a new author that is new to Bain, um, who is going to have a supernatural thriller out next year. But I hear there is, it's a cross between Larry Correa's Monster Hunter International series and Jim Butcher's Dresden Files. Sounds really cool. Marcus, you have a fascinating background. U.S. Army veteran, you're a paratrooper. Um, you were a, an air marshal and a trainer of air marshals. You just had a lot of really cool occupations. I would like to know if you've you've come across some book in your life that has to do with some of the things you've done that might uh, that might interest the Bain audience. Absolutely. What I'm going to recommend is a couple of nonfiction books that I think um, are really germane to the the subject matter that my novel uh, and the series touches on. And um, one book is called Adversaries Walk Among Us by John Livingston. John is one of the preeminent shamanic depossession exorcism people in the country. His book is a really excellent examination of that, uh, that practice and how it applies in, in the world. And it's, he does a kind of cross-cultural, cross-religious comparison of the practice there. That's a really good book. Now, Marcus, your uh, your book is sort of a, it's a supernatural thriller, right? You have yes, a uh, detective who uses shamanic practices and 
and guns. <laughs> to... <laughs> Actually, he's a shamanic practitioner first who kind of stumbles into having to have his buddy Dylan, who's kind of like his 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 hawk to his Spencer, you know? He's like the gunfighter that has to take care of his buddy who's busy fighting the heavy-duty spiritual powers, but he needs somebody to deal with the minions of the dark forces who's a preeminent gunfighter. And so since they share a little bit of that gun love thing, you know, they go on and uh, that's where a lot of that action comes from in that particular uh, piece of it. Also that there are aspects of the dark forces that can be best dealt with with an amalgam of lead, gold, and silver, you know? (laughs) jacketed into the 357 and launched at high rates of speed. So Adversaries Walk Among Us, a very good book, a little bit controversial within the shamanic community, but I think well well worth reading for a very clear, excellent, um, cleanly written examination of that field. Another um, really excellent book was written by uh, the psychologist Dr. Edith Fiore, and it's called The Unquiet Dead, and it's 5,000 case studies of her practice of what's called compassionate depossession. When she was a a working clinical psychologist, she found a number of instances where she would put people in hypnosis and find herself talking to somebody other than the person who came in with the um, presenting symptoms. And she developed a method of spirit releasement of crossing over those individuals. Both of these books, I think, are really excellent because they're grounded in stuff that actually happens. And I think it's a really good entree for people to say, ah, puh, I don't believe any of that stuff. To say, well, here's the experiences of somebody very carefully and scientifically documented. Take a look at it and make your own decision. You know, decide for yourself. Cool. Well, thank you so much. We've been talking to Marcus Wynn, whose new supernatural thriller will be out from Bain in 2014. Thanks so much for uh, being with us today, Marcus. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Big shout out to all the Bain community, especially all the veterans out there. Thank you. And God bless you. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. I'm a crazy big user of Audible myself. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has defeated one long-standing enemy, the Havenites, and reached a truce with another menace, the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Goldpeak, commands the Royal Manticoran Navy forces in the Talbot Quadrant. That's a region allied with the Star Kingdom, and on the border of the restive frontier of Solarian space. Goldpeak sympathizes with the rebels, but wants to be careful that whatever help she supplies is in a time and place of her own choosing. Her first chance to strike a blow against the Sali Office of Frontier Security and the Frontier Fleet is in the Saltash system, where the system governor has impounded Manticoran merchant ships in a deliberate act of provocation. Royal Manticoran Navy Commodore Jacob Zavala and his destroyer squadron have arrived in system to release the merchantmen from illegal Sali confinement. And after a devastating display of Manticoran martial superiority, Zavala has the upper hand. The system governor has attempted to call Zavala's bluff, but Zavala isn't bluffing. A Manticoran boarding party, led by Lieutenant Abigail Hearns, is now aboard the orbital station where the merchants are being held, and they've received aid from an unexpected quarter. The station commander can't surrender the captives outright, but he can get his people out of the way and point the boarding party in the right direction. Lieutenant Hearns and her troop have made first contact with the Solarian gendarmes holding the merchantmen hostage, and her demands have been met with arrogant defiance. But the lieutenant has a plan. Here is Part 23 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 16 Want him to wonder why he's being kicked out an airlock without a skin suit? Anger smoked through Major John Pole like sea smoke as he listened to the playback of Christofferson's conversation with the Manti lieutenant. Through an oversight, which Pole planned to correct as soon as this current business was resolved, he had no access to the surveillance systems outside Victor 7 when the Shona station went to emergency comm conditions, 
which meant he'd been unable to watch or listen to Christofferson's conversation with the Mantis until the captain had returned with his recording of the entire incident. Oversight my ass, Paul thought furiously now, remembering that bitch McWilliams' expression as she apologized so profusely for her inability to tap him into her systems. It was a purely technical problem, she'd assured him, and one Commander McVeigh's tech people would rectify the instant the current emergency let them stand down from their damage control duties. Paul felt his teeth grate together in memory, yet there was nothing he could do about it at the moment. Besides, he had other things to be worrying about. She's fucking crazy, sir, Christofferson said harshly. She wanted me to go for my pulser and give that big son of a bitch an excuse to blow me away. Paul's grunt of agreement might have contained a modicum of sympathy for his subordinate's frayed nerves, although, if pressed, he would have had to admit the universe would have survived quite handily if the Mantis had taken Christofferson out. Unfortunately, that didn't mean the captain's estimate of this Hearns's sanity was an error. Excuse me, sir. Captain Leonie Asher, Charlie Company's CO, said respectfully, but shouldn't we consider the possibility that these people mean what they're saying? What, that they'll come in here after us? Actually launch some kind of assault on a facility whose security is guaranteed by the Solarian Gendarmerie? Paul glared at her, and she shrugged ever so slightly. Sir, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should simply roll over for the first Neobarb to start throwing his or her weight around, but she had a point. This Zavala has already taken out four battle cruisers. It may be that he's out of control, as well as out of his mind, that he's way outside what his superiors expected when they gave him his orders. All that could be true. Hell, it probably is true, but he still committed an outright act of war already, and I think we have to seriously consider the possibility that he'll keep right on going. Let's face it, sir. At this point, he's got to get his spacers back. You're saying he's painted himself so far into a corner he doesn't have any choice but to keep going? He's got to get what he came for if he's going to have a prayer of covering his ass when his superiors find out he's created this kind of incident with the League? Something like that, sir. Asher nodded. Paul considered what she'd said. With Captain Myers and Captain Truchinsky off commanding detachments elsewhere, she and Christofferson were the only company commanders currently aboard Shona Station. Although Asher was junior to Christofferson and two of her company's platoons were off station at the moment, she was far and away the more valuable asset. She'd always been smarter, a lot smarter, actually, than the other captain, which was why Paul had sent Christofferson out to meet the Mantis. If they really were as out of control as the destruction of Dubrovskaya's warship suggested, and if something went wrong and he had to lose one of them, he'd preferred for it to be Christofferson. All of which suggested he really should consider the possibility that Asher had a point, and probably a damned good one. Unfortunately, there wasn't much he could do about it. Governor Duaneus had given him his orders in person in a calm conversation he'd carefully recorded as part of the official record, and that left Paul very little wiggle room. If he surrendered the interned mantis, he'd be disobeying a direct order from his legal superior. The gendarmerie would be furious enough with him for yielding to some neo-barb navy's threats, however hopeless his situation, given the disastrous precedent that would set. If he not only rolled over, but did so in defiance of direct orders not to, he'd simply hand the inevitable board of inquiry and the court-martial, which would no doubt follow, an even bigger hammer with which to reduce him and his career to very tiny, well-pulverized pieces, and he could be damn sure Duaneus would do his level best and use every favor he was owed to blame the disaster here in Saltash on anyone except himself. Major Pole didn't doubt the governor was already scheming to come up with an official explanation, which would make the destruction of Vice Admiral Dubrovskaya's squadron entirely her fault. The idea was ridiculous, but in the competition between a dead frontier fleet admiral and a live frontier security governor— the one who was still breathing was almost certain to come out on top, 
regardless of any inconvenient little things like facts. Under the circumstances, the last thing Pohl could afford would be to simultaneously disappoint Duenas and give the governor an excuse to hang the League's humiliating surrender on him. In the end, someone was going to be scapegoated for what had happened here, and whoever it was would be fortunate if all that happened was that his career came to an abrupt and ignominious end. More likely, the powers that were would decide an example had to be made, and John Pohl had no intention of providing the example. The survival rate for ex-gendarmes who found themselves guests of the penal system was far too low for that. The problem was that Asher might well be right about whether or not Zavala was willing to push things. He truly might send in those boarders to reclaim the mantis by force. For that matter, he truly might be so crazy he really would treat Solarian gendarmes as common pirates if they fell into his hands. We can't just play dead for him, he said finally. That's completely unacceptable. Christofferson and Asher glanced at each other, then back at him, and he bared his teeth. They may think it's going to be easy to get into this module, he said. If they do, it's up to us to demonstrate their error. We've probably got more troopers in here than they have boarders out there. There are only so many ways they can come at us. We know the station a hell of a lot better than they do, and we've also got the advantage of the defensive position. We've got a lot more heavy weapons than we saw in this, too. He jabbed an angry finger at the recording they'd all just viewed. If they try to fight their way in, we'll massacre them. And if they use their cruiser's point defense to blow a way in from the outside, sir? Asher asked. There's no way even a maniac would do that. Paul waved his hand dismissively. You think they're going to risk explosively depressurizing the entire module when they're so anxious to get their people back unharmed? He shook his head. No. If they try to fight their way in here, they're going to have to come to us on our terms. And when they do, we'll bleed them. Asher's eyes looked doubtful, and the Major glared at her. I'm not going to just hand over their spacers against direct orders without at least trying to hang on to them. He said flatly, and I think they may be more amenable to reason once they figure out how much trying to take them back by force is going to cost. Asher still looked unconvinced, but Paul didn't really care. He didn't believe for a moment that he could hang on to the interned mantis indefinitely, but he was confident he could inflict heavy casualties on any manty attempt to fight their way into Victor Seven, and when he did, they'd pull back to rethink. At that point, if he were this Zavala, he'd find a way to tighten the screws on Duenas. There was no doubt in Pohl's mind that anyone with the only operable warships in a star system could find a way to convince that system's governor to see reason sooner or later— especially when the governor in question was stuck out in the open where the mantis could get at him without killing the people they wanted to rescue themselves. And if Zavala convinced Duenas to order Pole to hand the internees over, even if it was obviously only under duress, the monkey was off the major's back. And if he can't convince Duenas to play ball, I'm no worse off than I was before, he thought. In fact, if I lose a couple of dozen gendarmes and then hand over the mantis to prevent further bloodshed, I may even be able to make a case for its being Duenas's fault for ordering me not to cough them up in the first place. If I phrase my report right, make it clear I was prepared to go all the way and only back down to save Solarian lives from a homicidal neobarb, once it became obvious my civilian superior had misread the situation disastrously, the gendarmerie will be in a hell of a lot better position to hammer frontier security over this instead of our carrying the can. Well, time's up, my lady, Gutierrez said. Indeed it is, Abigail agreed. So, I suppose we should go ahead and get this ship off the field— if you'd be so good, Matteo? Of course, my lady. 
Gutierrez nodded and glanced around to be sure all his people were where he'd told them to be before he stepped cautiously to the edge of the corridor down which Christofferson had departed in such high dudgeon. He extended a sensor wand into the corridor's mouth, and the multi-spectrum pickup projected a detailed heads-up view of the passageway onto the inside of his skin-suit helmet. He cycled through the visible spectrum into infrared and then into ultraviolet, and grunted in unsurprised satisfaction as he spotted the web of tripwire lasers covering the last third or so of the forty-meter corridor. The blast doors at the far end, where the spoke-like axial passage actually entered Victor Seven, were closed, but someone had cut what looked suspiciously like firing loopholes through the heavy-duty panels. A little closer inspection showed that the tripwires he'd picked up were connected to anti-personnel mines which had been attached to the bulkheads and deckhead. The mines were covered with nanotech chameleon skin designed to blend into the alloy to which they'd been affixed, but the people who'd emplaced them were gendarmes, more skilled in thuggery than any sort of actual military training. They hadn't even bothered to detach the laser sensors from the mines. They'd left them mounted on the mine housings, and with that for a starting point, it wasn't hard for his sensor wand to locate the mines by their internal power packs. You know, my lady, he said absently, still cataloging threats, if we were willing to get in line and march straight down the middle of the passageway here, and maybe go ahead and paint big bullseyes on our chests, too, they probably could get a lot of us. I know how good you are, Matteo, Abigail replied soothingly. There's no need to be nasty to them just because they aren't. I'm sure they're doing the very best they can. The scary thing is, you're probably right about that. He studied his HUD for a few more moments, then nodded. About what we expected, my lady. Not much finesse, but let's be fair. It's a straight corridor into the first blast door. How much room for finesse is there? I suppose that depends on a lot of factors, she said with a crooked smile. Go ahead and get their attention, Matteo. Aye, aye, my lady. The gendarmerie squad on the far side of those blast doors had failed to notice Gutierrez's sensor wand, but Sergeant Clinton Abernathy, the squad's leader, had grown increasingly nervous as the minutes ticked by. This wasn't the kind of crap he'd signed up for, and the rumors about what this particular batch of neobarbs had already done only made bad a lot worse. He didn't like any part of this, and he failed to share Major Paul's confidence that these people would back down in the face of a demonstration of manly determination. Perhaps that was because he and his squad had been chosen to do the initial demonstrating. There were three access routes to Victor 7 from the rest of Shona Station. This one, following the main axial from the lift shafts, was the most direct and the broadest, which made it the logical path for a full-fledged assault. The second route ran through the materials handling conduit, through which consumables and refuse were transported into and out of the habitat module. It hadn't been planned for humans to use, however, and it would have been a cramped and tortuous way to get at the module's garrison. At the moment, all of its blast doors had been closed and remote sensors had been set to alert the defenders if those doors were disturbed. It seemed unlikely anyone would try coming that way, but if they did, there'd be plenty of warning in time to get blocking forces into position. The third possible way in was really designed as an emergency evacuation route, and it was less liberally supplied with blast doors, since it was supposed to stay open and accessible for people trying to get out of Victor 7 in the face of disaster. The good news was that it had a lot more bends and was rather narrower than the axial passageway, even if it was more accessible than the materials tube. They'd had to position more people to cover it, but they had good fields of fire, and the mantis would have to come out in the open around the turns in the corridor wall to get at them. But still... Movement! Corporal Marjorie Pareja snapped suddenly. What? Where? Abernathy demanded, peering at the handheld display feeding from the fixed pickup on the far side of the blast doors. Zebra Tango! Pareja replied. Gutierrez watched as the sensor remote he'd bounced up the passageway rolled to a stop just short of the first line of mines. He didn't really need it, but seeing how quickly the other side reacted to it should be informative. One, 
two, three, four. He'd just reached seven when a burst of pulsar darts from one of the loopholes destroyed the remote. Lord, he muttered. These clowns are as pathetic as those bats. I mean, as those jackasses on Tiberian, milady. He shook his head. Seven seconds to react at all, and then, instead of a single shot, the morons had fired an entire burst? The ricocheting pulsar darts had taken out three of their own minds, and it wasn't even as if the remote had been telling him anything he hadn't already known in the first place. Don't complain, Matteo, Abigail said sternly. I'm not, it's just... He shrugged irritably, a master craftsman frustrated by the slovenly workmanship of a would-be competitor, and glanced at Senior Chief Petty Officer Franklin Musgrave, Tristram's bosun. Ready, Frank? Ready, Musgrave confirmed. Then punch it. Fire in the hole. Musgrave slid just the muzzle of his weapon around the edge of the corridor and squeezed the firing stud. It was an awkward angle, and despite the stabilizing presser beam projected against one of the lift shafts from the launcher's other end, the recoil was significant. Musgrave had expected that, however. He kept control of the bucking launcher without much difficulty, and the projectile's flight path had been programmed to allow for the muzzle rise as it departed downrange. Because of the short range, the other end of the passage was actually inside the launcher's danger zone, and the fact that no one in his right mind wanted to be within forty or fifty meters of a kinetic strike from a weapon that powerful, they'd had to step down its normal acceleration rate considerably and go with the chemical-shaped charge warhead instead of its usual dart-like penetrator. Even that was bad enough, since it was designed to take out light-armored vehicles, but at least the vast majority of the blast would expend itself on the other side of the blast doors. Sergeant Clinton Abernathy had a single fleeting instant to realize what the launcher was before it fired, but that was all the warning he had before he, the blast doors, and his entire squad ceased to exist. Jesus Christ! Surprise jerked the blasphemy out of Christofferson as Abernathy's squad was wiped from existence. That was a tank killer, his company first sergeant blurted. No, you think? Christofferson snarled with a baleful glare that closed the first sergeant's mouth with a snap. Tell Lieutenant Boudreau to reinforce Axial 1 and Axial 3 and tell his people to keep their heads friggin' down. These bastards have got heavier weapons than we thought. That was noisy, Gutierrez observed. He tossed another remote down the corridor and grimaced. Messy, too. They had their chance to do it the easy way, Mateo, Abigail replied harshly. Like you say, even those bastards on Tiberian were smarter than this. Let's keep the pressure on them. Aye, aye, milady. Well, at least they're not shy, Major Pole growled, studying his tactical display. None of the mantis Christofferson had seen before he withdrew to deliver Lieutenant Hearn's ultimatum had been armed with anything like that tank killer. That was going to make things messier, but weapons that heavy were going to be less useful to the attackers as they moved into Victor Seven proper. They weren't going to have any more firing lines as long as that first one, and without powered armor of their own, no one was going to want to be anywhere near the backblast from something like that when it was confined and channeled by one of the station's passageways. That was the good news. The bad news was that now that they'd blown their way past the late Sergeant Abernathy's squad, their menu of approach routes got a lot broader. Pole's people knew the internal geography of their habitat far better than the Mantis possibly could, but covering all the possible approaches with enough forward-deployed firepower to stop people equipped with such heavy weapons was going to take a lot of manpower. He considered offering to hand over the internees now that the Mantis had demonstrated they were serious, but he couldn't do that. Yet. If he didn't want to be the one who ended up carrying the can for this entire debacle, he had to be able to argue that he genuinely tried to obey the ridiculous, unreasonable orders he'd been given, and that meant he was going to have to accept heavier casualties before he recognized the inevitable and gave in. It was unfortunate, of course— but at least his command post was well back from the point of contact. He was pretty sure he'd have time to accrue sufficient casualties to cover his ass before the actual fighting got anywhere near him. 
Okay, things are about to get tricky, milady, Gutierrez said. He was two blast doors deeper into Victor Seven, and Abigail had downloaded the damage control guide's memory to his skin suit as well as her own. More copies had been uploaded to Nicasio Hamar, Tristram's assistant tactical officer, as well as to Senior Chief Musgrave and all the other senior non-coms attached to the boarding party. Now, Abigail and Gutierrez studied the imagery together, even though they were the better part of fifty meters apart. We could cut through this engineering crawlway, Gutierrez pointed out, highlighting the crawlway in question on both huds. That'd get us around behind them right here. He highlighted the closed, loopholed blast doors just ahead of his current position, where the gendarmes had set up another strong point. If we were actually trying to fight our way through them, that would probably be a good idea, Abigail replied. Since we're not... Since we're not, I guess we need to knock on the door again, Gutierrez replied. He sat back, thinking for a moment. As he'd said, things were about to get tricky. To get at the strong point, the manticorans would have to make their way around a relatively sharp bend in the passageway. The problem was that they'd be exposed to fire from the gendarmes the instant they poked their heads around the turn. There wasn't room for them to use Musgrave's launcher here either. With a marine fire team in proper powered armor, a heavy tri-barrel, and a plasma rifle, it would have been a straightforward tactical problem. Without any of those, he was just going to have to adapt, improvise, and overcome. McFarlane. Yes, LT? P.O. First Class William McFarlane replied. Bring your little friend up here. On my way, LT. McFarlane, one of Tristram's damage control specialists, crawled up behind Gutierrez less than a minute later. The Marine turned armsman slithered back a little so that he and McFarlane could both look at a hand display. We need to make that door go away, Gutierrez said, tapping the display. Think your pet's up to it? Oh, yeah, McFarlane replied. Course, the people on the other side are going to be trying to stop him. I think we can probably do a little something about that, Gutierrez told him. Mind you, it would work better with a Bravo Charlie, but I guess we'll just have to make do. Don't you be hurting Danny's feelings, LT, McFarlane retorted with a grin. He'll do just fine. So let me get the cheering section organized, and then you can show me. Sergeant Norman Dreyfus wished his skin suit allowed for old-fashioned brow wiping. It wouldn't have changed anything, but at least he might have felt better. He also wished to hell he knew exactly what the advancing mantis were up to at the moment. Unfortunately, they'd been systematically taking out the sensors the gendarmes had emplaced. In fact, they'd been swatting sensors with ridiculous ease as they advanced, Obviously, the people responsible for planting those sensors hadn't concealed them anywhere nearly as well as they'd thought, which meant the best he could do was guess about what they were doing. That didn't make him happy, and the fact that their current location appeared to be just on the other side of his current location didn't make him any happier. The intruders were working their way inward along two separate routes, moving with a certain degree of caution, but without any particular effort to disguise their intentions— not that there would have been much point in subtlety, since there weren't all that many possible approaches. Still nothing, Altabani? he asked his sensor tech. No, she replied. You think I wouldn't have mentioned it if I'd seen anything? Shit, Norm, I know they're on the other side of that corner, but... Something rattled and rolled on the far side of the hatch, caroming along the bulkheads. Grenade! Altabani shouted as it spun its way up to the far side of the blast door and stopped abruptly when the manticorn who'd thrown it activated the tiny tractor unit. The manticorn in question was nowhere near anything Mateo Gutierrez would have called adequately trained, but she did pretty well for a navy puke. She'd watched the icon on her HUD as it bounded down the line of approach to the closed blast doors, then hit its anchoring tractor. She'd jumped the gun slightly, locking the grenade to the deck a dozen centimeters in front of the doors instead of to one of the actual panels, but that was close enough, and she hit the detonation key. Dreyfus bounced back and sat down, hard, as the concussion came at him, transmitted through the sealed door. 
Altabani swore as the sensor sheet poked through one of the loopholes was destroyed, and another of Dreyfus's troopers said something in a high falsetto tone as Blast came through his own loophole and blew him back the better part of a meter. His skin suit and body armor were more than enough to deal with it. His cry was born of shock and surprise, and fear more than injury. But that was all that happened, and Dreyfus felt a surge of relief as he climbed back up onto one knee. Altabani was already shoving another sensor into place, and Dreyfus bared his teeth at the rest of his squad. If that's the best they've got, they're screwed, he announced. Very nice, Gutierrez approved. Let's get the others in there now. A dozen Manticorans and Graysons sent grenades rolling around the corner, bouncing them off the bulkheads towards the blast doors. The blast door rattled and banged and vibrated as grenades went off on the other side, but none of the new blasts were anywhere near as powerful as that first one had been, and all of them seemed to be going off at greater distances. Central, this is Dreyfus, the sergeant announced over his comm. They're making a lot of noise, but I don't think they're getting any farther in than they are now. Good, Captain Christofferson replied. Keep us informed and... Sergeant Norman Dreyfus's world ended in fire and blast. Told you not to hurt Danny's feelings, McFarlane told Gutierrez. I stand corrected, Gutierrez replied, studying the wreckage with his sensor wand. He really would have preferred a Bravo Charlie, one of the Royal Manticorn Marine Corps' armored, countergrav-equipped robotic breaching charges. Of course, that would have constituted a pretty severe case of overkill against a mere civilian-grade blast door, and even though McFarlane's DNI-1 damage control remote hadn't been designed for the task, it had attached its beehive-shaped charge with neatness and precision under cover of the flashbangs and smoke grenades. It didn't have the armored protection of a Bravo Charlie, but it was designed to operate in an environment which would very quickly have incinerated or demolished a standard robotic unit. If the gendarmes had noticed it coming and targeted it, they could undoubtedly have destroyed it, yet the covering flashbangs had been far too light to hurt it. Now Gutierrez surveyed the wreckage of what had been a set of blast doors. Frank, Wilkie, let's get up there and secure the doors, he said, starting up the passageway himself. Looks like it's going to take a few minutes to clear the wreckage enough to move on. Major Pohl swore as his tactical display updated itself. The Mantis weren't actually moving all that rapidly, yet it was painfully obvious that wasn't because his people were stopping them. He'd expected to start inflicting casualties quickly when they had to clear their way through strong points, but they weren't cooperating. Instead, they were taking their time, and they appeared to have an inexhaustible supply of grenades and demolition charges. All he was really accomplishing with his strong points was to compel them to use up a few more explosives blowing their way through them. All right, they were clearly concentrating their efforts along Axial 3, and if they kept coming through another couple of sets of blast doors, that was going to lead them into one of the common areas Victor Seven's designers had laid out for the habitat's anticipated VIP inhabitants, a spacious, landscaped compartment 60 meters across, fitted with picnic tables, scattered conversational groups of chairs, and a small ornamental pool with a fountain. His eyes narrowed. He'd wanted short, restricted firing lines on the theory that they would favor the defender over the attacker, but this Lieutenant Hearns was obviously more experienced in boarding combat than any of his people. She was making those restricted fields of fire work for her, not the defenders, so maybe what he needed was a more extended firing range. He considered his options. Virtually all of Christofferson's troopers were already parceled out across the approaches, and he didn't dare thin out his forward defenses— the last thing he needed was to open up a second invasion route. That left him only the two platoons of Captain Asher's understrength company. He needed to maintain at least some reserve, but if he pulled up one of her platoons to reinforce the squad Christofferson already had covering the compartment, then ordered the other squad, which was covering the blast doors between it and the Mantis, to fall back. If this brainstorm of yours is actually working, milady, we're probably getting close, Gutierrez said over his private link to Abigail. If I were in charge on the other side, this is where I'd be stacking my fire. 
nice extended sight lines, and plenty of opportunity for converging fire on the only door the other guys could come through. It does look like the best opportunity for them, doesn't it? Abigail agreed, studying the detailed imagery from the damage control guide. I guess the only question's whether or not this major pole's going to pull enough strength from his reserve. Only one way to find out about that, Gutierrez said. I know. Abigail smiled fleetingly. That doesn't mean I have to like it, though. I really don't want to be wrong about this one, Mateo. Of course you don't, he replied in a gentler tone. But when you come down to it, you've got to drop the penny. I don't know if it'll work either, but I think it's our best shot. Abigail nodded. Her greatest fear, really, had been that the gendarmes would drag one of their manticoran prisoners into the middle of the firefight and threaten to kill him if she and her boarders refused to back off. Given the gendarmerie's normal disregard for civilian life, if it belonged to neobarbs, at least, she'd anticipated from the beginning that the Sollies would eventually call her bluff, find out if she truly was willing to continue attacking in the face of a direct threat to the prisoners. What she hadn't been able to estimate with any confidence was how soon they might do that. It seemed unlikely they'd risk that sort of escalation until they were convinced they wouldn't be able to stop her any other way, however, which was the entire basis of the strategy she'd adopted. Hopefully, Major Pohl was bright enough to recognize the defensive possibilities Gutierrez had just described. If he was, and if he committed enough of his reserve... All right, everybody, she announced over the tactical net. It's just about time to dance. Report readiness. A chorus of responses came back to her, and she nodded. Mateo, start the music. Nicasio, let's be about it. Get ready, Captain Asher snapped as Denny blew another set of blast doors into wreckage. Now, Lieutenant Nicasio Kamar said crisply, and the Royal Manticorn Navy personnel standing on the surface of Habitat Module Victor 7 moved forward. Just finding the emergency personnel lock should have been a non-trivial challenge, and even after the mantis had found them, they should have had to burn or blast their way inside. They certainly shouldn't have been able to override the entry codes and cycle their personnel through them without anyone noticing, but that, of course, assumed they didn't have access to Shona Station's classified damage control files. They're behind us! They're behind us! What the hell? John Paul's head flew up as his tactical display changed abruptly. Half a dozen of his single reserve platoon's icons went crimson in the same instant, and three more blinked from green to amber, or red, even as he watched. That couldn't be right. The mantis couldn't. Central, they're hitting us from... The voice chopped off in mid-sentence, and Paul's face went white as even more icons went down. Others were falling back desperately, abandoning their positions, and he heard heavy firing and explosions over the open circuit— but that wasn't possible. There was no way the Mantis could have... Sir, the Mantis want to talk to you, a pale-faced communications tech said. Paul stared at him and the tech pointed at a display. Somehow, the Mantis had patched into the station's secure communications net. Paul stood for a moment, frozen, while his brain tried to process the information coming at him. None of this could be happening, but... Sir, the com tech said almost plaintively, and the major shook himself viciously back to life and turned to the indicated display. What? He got out. His voice sounded strangled even to himself, and the young woman on the display smiled coldly. I'm in contact with my people who have just taken control of your brig, major, she said flatly. I understand at least twenty-five of your gendarmes have surrendered to them. At the moment, your people are being locked into cells, and my people are evacuating the way they came. I very much doubt you have anyone in a position to intervene, and if you do, I'd strongly recommend you don't try it. So far, whether you believe it or not, I've been trying to avoid killing any more of your people than I have to. I'm perfectly prepared to abandon that approach if you insist, however. Her smile was icy, but her eyes were colder still. 
and something inside Major John Pohl shriveled under their weight. So, tell me, Major, she invited, which way would you like me to handle it? That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 23, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Hank Davis, Christopher Chifani, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a 21 gun salute from cannons filled with William Turner and Winslow Homer masterpieces to Bane cover artist extraordinaire Bob Eggleton. Please join us here next time at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. Keep reaching for the stars. 